Well, hello everyone. Now, some viewers of this channel may not realise that I have written and published five books on Shakespeare. And in this video, I'm going to outline what your English teacher likely missed when they were teaching you Shakespeare's Hamlet. Now, I'm not saying that your English teacher necessarily missed what I'm about to tell you, but I would estimate that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of school children uh, throughout the world and across history have routinely been mistaught this play for some of the reasons I will outline uh, shortly. Before I do that, I think it's worth going over some of the basic plot points of Hamlet, uh, especially for the benefit of those of you who either have not read the play recently or studied it in the past, let's say, 10 or 15 years. So, to begin with, the play begins with Hamlet mourning the death of his father, as his mother, Gertrude, marries his uncle, King Claudius. And Hamlet is not happy about this, not least because uh, not a lot of time has elapsed between the death of his father uh, and his mother's remarriage. Shortly after this, Hamlet is visited by the ghost of his father, who is called Old Hamlet, who informs him that he was murdered by Claudius, and then he asks Hamlet to murder Claudius as revenge. Now, Hamlet cannot be sure if the ghost is legitimate. You know, this could be some trick that was played on him. It's quite unusual to see a ghost at the best of times. So he devises a play called The Mousetrap in order to catch the conscience of the king. And his basic idea is to depict uh, the murder of Hamlet on stage uh, with somebody else, i.e. Claudius, pouring uh, poison into the ear uh, of the king uh, and then he's going to study how Claudius reacts and then use that to establish whether he thinks the king is guilty or not. So then when the mousetrap is actually put on, King Claudius stands up and leaves during it and Hamlet takes this as proof of his guilt. And at this point, he resolves to kill the king. Although he does take uh, quite a while about doing this, uh, another th three or four acts. Um, later, Claudius's guilt is confirmed to the audience when Claudius confesses during a prayer. And Hamlet, at this point, at this moment, has the chance to kill Claudius, but for whatever reason, does not. Uh, he actually provides a re reason himself. He says, well, if I kill him now, Claudius will get to go to heaven and I don't want him to have a chance at repentance. I want him to go to hell. So rather than kill him when, while he's at prayer, I'm going to kill him uh, when he's having sex with my mother or at some other moment where he's up to no good. So he goes directly to hell. That's the reason he gives. It's up to you whether you believe him or not. Hamlet could be buying time or he could be coping in some way for why he didn't go through with it. Now, most school children have been taught that Hamlet is chiefly a play about the question of the protagonist's procrastination. That is, why does Hamlet take so long to kill Claudius. And it's often been joked, you know, if Hamlet had been Othello or had he been uh, Macbeth, for example, the play would only be about half an hour long. You know, the ghost tells Othello or he tells Macbeth what needs to be done and then they immediately go and kill Claudius Curtin. Um, however, that is not what happens in Hamlet. He takes, uh, you know, we have this whole... Uh, uh, subplot about the, the mousetrap where he's trying to establish the guilt uh, of Claudius and then even after he does that he takes quite a while to get round to doing the deed. And this procrastination reading of the play was first popularised by A.C. Bradley in 1904. A.C. Bradley was a professor of poetry at Oxford and he popularised many of the uh, typical ways in which uh, the plays are read. Uh, however, unfortunately, in this case, there were quite a number of things he overlooked about the play. Um, 
and these aspects of the play are often forgotten when they're taught uh, both by school teachers and indeed uh, by some literary professors as well. And the main complaint is ably outlined here by Amir Khan. He says, why should a well-educated young man have second thoughts when it comes to killing a close relative who also happens to be the king of the land and the husband of his own mother? This is some enigma indeed, and the problem is not that a satisfactory answer has never been found, but that we should keep looking for one. Should our enormous critical literature on Hamlet fall some day into the hands of people otherwise ignorant of our mores, they could not fail to conclude that our academic tribe must have been a savage breed indeed. After four centuries of controversies, Hamlet's temporary reluctance to commit murder still looks so outlandish to us that more and more books are being written in an unsuccessful effort to solve that mystery. The only way to account for this curious body of literature is to suppose that back in the 20th century, no more was needed than the request of some ghost, and the average professor of literature would massacre his entire household without batting an eyelid. Khan obviously uh, employing no small degree of sarcasm there, but the point is well made. Actually, if you look at the details of the play in the cold light of day, Hamlet's procrastination is actually quite rational. Now, a lot of the things I'm about to point out were first uh, pointed out by W.W. W. Gregg, who you can see here, back in 1917. Um, and, uh, I mean, I think Gregg's reading of the play is very good and quite assiduous. And once I point out the things that Gregg does, I'm sure you're going to agree. First thing to mention is that uh, Shakespeare anachronistically establishes that Hamlet, along with Horatio, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern uh, as well, studied at the Wittenberg uh, University. Incidentally, that is where Martin Luther had studied and taught. Now, this was actually impossible since Wittenberg was not established until 1502, and Hamlet is set in medieval Denmark. But given that point, maybe Shakespeare had a reason for sending Hamlet to Wittenberg. Maybe he was trying to say something. Wittenberg was known for its rationalistic, legal and humanist curriculum. And in Shakespeare's time, it was associated with Protestantism, especially, of course, due to the association with Martin Luther. It establishes, if nothing else, that Hamlet was philosophically and legally uh, minded. And of course, there's that famous line, there are more things in heaven and earth, uh, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. And this accounts, among other things, for why he feels the need to prove Claudius's guilt and why Hamlet, almost uniquely in Shakespeare's plays, is constantly kind of weighing things up as in the famous to be or not to be speech. He's always trying to weigh one thing against another on this hand, but on the other hand, it's a very loyally and indeed a number of legal scholars have written interesting papers on just how much like a lawyer Hamlet is leading to speculation that uh, Hamlet indeed studied law at Wittenberg. I actually uh, looked into what Hamlet may have studied at Wittenberg, like, what was the curriculum back then. They would have done the trivium uh, which you can actually take on here on this channel um, I, I run the academic agency where you can do the uh, the classical trivium. Uh, I've kind of updated it a bit for the modern age. Um, so he, he, they would have studied studied logic and rhetoric and um, grammar, but also um, they did uh, philosophy, theology, and uh, legal training as well, law. And in fact, you can have a look at what the typical kind of German university education was like. Uh, simply by reading Martin Luther's uh, edu education around this time. Um, now, it's kind of interesting that uh, much of the theology of the play, Hamlet, is quasi-Catholic. Uh, Protestants had abolished such notions as purgatory and ghosts, 
Um, and, it, and in fact, the, the well-known Shakespeare scholar Stephen Greenblatt has an entire book about this called Hamlet in Purgatory, where he looks at some of the theological implications uh, of, you know, these sorts of notions being in this play. And indeed, uh, Hamlet, having studied, uh, you know, Protestant uh, center there. Um, anyway, so this is one uh, aspect that people often forget about is that well, what sort of person was Hamlet? He was a scholar. He, he obviously valued reason. He was into philosophy and possibly he had some legal training as well. Um, quite why he was going to university at the age of 30 is something that people have debated for a long time. Um, but there, are, there is some evidence that uh, Danes in this period, um, there's, a, there's a contemporary of Shakespeare's called Robert Greene, who has a little pas passage where he suggests that um, Danes studied until the age of 40. So maybe it was some strange notion they had in London that Danish people like were, you know, stayed at university for ages. Um, also, uh, there is a plot point in Hamlet that Gertrude and Claudius don't want Hamlet to resume his studies. They want him to stay at court, whereas Hamlet wants to go back to university. So there is, you know, Hamlet himself is a kind of perpetual student um, so this is something worth bearing in mind, that he's a kind of, you know, uh, someone who values learning and education. So uh, the next thing before I get to Greg's main five observations is that Hamlet does not know what the audience does throughout the play. And this is routinely forgotten, of course, because Hamlet is one of the most well-known pieces of literary uh it's one of the best known pieces of literature in the world and possibly the best known play. Um, therefore, there's almost no such thing as a, as a, you know, a Shakespeare spoiler. Certainly there's no such thing as a Hamlet spoiler. So people write about this play and they talk about this play as if everybody knows what the details are. But of course, Hamlet himself doesn't know what's going to happen in, in Hamlet. And this is easily forgotten uh, because the play is so familiar to us. All right, so let us get on to the five things that Greg points out. First is that Claudius, during the, the mousetrap, there's a, a part of the uh, play which is a dumb show. Before the actual play takes place, they perform a dumb show. And this is where the pouring of the poison in the king's ear happens. And... Uh, this is known as the argument, and it is implied by Ophelia asking Claudius, have you seen the argument uh, to, to Claudius, that he hasn't actually seen it, like he didn't take notice of what was going on. If he had seen it, he doesn't react in the slightest. He just, he doesn't respond. There's no stage direction. And this fact is not only overlooked by uh, Hamlet, but also by audiences and readers of the play um, a lot of people imagine that this is the moment where the poison is poured in the ear that Claudius stands up it's actually not the moment that Claudius stands up and this is pretty significant the second uh, thing that Greg notes and there you can see this depiction of the poison in the in the ear and Claudius saying look I'm not looking at that but that doesn't actually happen in the play it only happens in your imagination Claudius does not rise from his seat because he recognizes his murder of his brother being depicted, he rises because he sees the depiction of regicide at the hands of a nephew. Now, depicting regicide um, was a big, especially before the king, was a big no-no uh, at, at that time. And Claudius reacted as any king would have done, watching regicide take place uh, on the stage. Indeed, in, in Shakespeare's own time, um, they wouldn't even put on. So, so Shakespeare has a play in which um, called Richard II, where Richard II that abdicates, and we know that in public performances they would not stage the abdication. That was considered um, too controversial to, to show. They did do it in private performances. So obviously this would have been a public performance because Claudius is the king, therefore it has to be public, and th there's no way he would have stayed for that moment so he only rises then he doesn't rise 
when the poison is poured in, into the ear. Therefore, Hamlet cannot conclude anything concrete from the mousetrap because it is perfectly possible, one, the ghost has lied because Claudius doesn't react to the poison being poured down the ear. Um, and, he, you know, as I said, he responds to the Regis side. And despite that, Claudius standing up seems to convince Hamlet completely that the king is guilty. Uh, Hamlet says, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pounds. And then we, the audience and the readers of the play, are carried along by the strength of Hamlet's conviction, although we do not see the tell as being definitive as he does. So Hamlet is convinced at that moment, and therefore we are convinced. But actually, if we were really looking at the evidence, it's still pretty flimsy, really. If you were looking at it objectively, it's not much of a tell. Fourth, it is often forgotten that Hamlet does not hear Claudius's confession in Act 3, Scene 3. There's this scene where Claudius confesses in prayer. And so while uh, this is all the evidence the audience needs, Hamlet must make do with a shaky tell from the mousetrap. So this is basically Shakespeare's way of telling us, the audience, that Claudius did really do it. But Hamlet doesn't see that. Hamlet doesn't doesn't overhear anything that Claudius says. Um, he, so it is. He still has to go on the fact that Claudius stands up. Right now, j just imagine for a moment. This was you. OK, you are trying to establish whether your uncle killed your father. You put on a play and he stands up at a moment when you probably would expect him to stand up under normal circumstances still not pretty still not great evidence to go on um and then finally therefore a lot of critics including and especially ac bradley read hamlet's procrastination into the play from the benefit of hindsight and privileged knowledge whereas in fact if one considers only the information at his disposal his jumping into conclusions about Claudius's guilt is quite the reverse of hesitancy. It is rash. And this can be seen if one imagines the play without witnessing Claudius's confession. So this is some pretty careful reading by Greg. And he is running this kind of counterfactual idea. Well, what if we watch this play without knowing what happens in it? What if we watched it only from the point of view of what Hamlet sees and knows? Um... And it's a perfectly legitimate point, which is routinely forgotten when people study this play. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this uh, video. Uh, if you'd like to know more about my courses, I'll play an advert in a moment. But most importantly of all, friends, get out. Buy Foundations of Writing on the Academic Agency. To write clearly will help you to think clearly. The ability to communicate ideas in lucid prose is foundational to success in many areas, and it is a basic requirement in every walk of life. You will learn the parts of speech and come to understand the core functions of the English language, sentence construction and syntax, punctuation, style, and common mistakes. Once you see how mistakes are made, you will not unsee them. You will know for the rest of your life. Foundations of Writing. Buy it now.